Okay. Uh, thanks to the organizers. Uh, uh, any, right. So. <laughs> anyway, so I'm supposed to talk about obstruction bundle gluing, and the references are um, so there are these two unreadable papers by myself and Tobbs, uh, gluing something, 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 parts one and two. Uh, and the fun part begins in the second paper, section five. So there, um, it explains the gory details for obstruction bundle gluing for holomorphic curves in four dimensions. Um, and, uh, but I'm gonna start with the simplest non-trivial example I could think of, which is from Morse theory. Uh, and that example is on my blog, fleurhomology.wordpress.com, uh, in a posting from July of last year. Um, and I'm not going to talk about this at all, but there's another nice example of similar techniques in a paper by Urkau Bao and Kohanda um, on contact homology, 1412.0276. Uh, uh, so you might find that interesting also. Um, so what is obstruction bundle gluing? So um, obstruction bundle gluing is a way of gluing things when transversality fails, but it doesn't fail catastrophically. So you don't, might not need polyfolds, but it kind of fails, so you need something. Um, and it'll be interesting later to compare this with the polyfold stuff. So, so Helmut next week is going to talk about the definition of symplectic field theory by polyfolds. So the polyfolds say, well, you can get some numbers, and these numbers satisfy some properties so that you define invariance. Um, but maybe you don't know much about these numbers. But in some situations, you actually want to know what these numbers are. You want to know what's going on. For example, if you have, you have a situation where you know what all the holomorphic curves are, but, tr but transversality fails. You want to know what are the numbers with which you're counting these things. And obstruction bundle gluing is relevant to this question, as we'll see. Um, OK, so here's the, here, but here's the Morse theory example I want to start with, because it's, it's easier. And then we'll, we'll talk about the holomorphic curve stuff later. Um, so I want to consider circle-valued Morse theory. Uh, a circle value just to allow this phenomenon that I want to tell you about to occur. So we have a finite dimensional smooth manifold, and we have a Morse function. Um, and you choose a metric. That allows you to define the gradient vector field. Um, and then, so, so Morse means, I mean, if you have a circle valued function, then locally it's, um, its derivative is, is the derivative of a real valued function. So, so locally it looks like a real valued function. <coughs> so the same definition of what's the Morse function. Okay, um, and then you can define a Morse complex where you do the usual thing. Um, you count, count gradient flow lines between critical points. The only issue is you have to be a little careful because there can actually be infinitely many flow lines between any two critical points. Um, so I, if I draw my manifold X like this, and F is this sort of circle direction in the picture. Um, maybe there's a critical point over here and the flow line is some critical point over there. The flow lines can sort of go around in the circle direction many times. So there can be inf infinitely many of them. So to get a finite count, you pick some level set that doesn't contain any critical points. And say it, say it has no critical points in it. Um, and this theory is defined over a nova covering, which in this case is um, power series in a formal variable t with coefficients in z. Um, and 
the differential of a critical point. So if P is an index I critical point is the sum over critical points Q of index I minus one of, um, and then we have the sum from K equals zero to infinity in the form of variable T to the K times some count of flow lines from P to Q. Um, let's put a K here. Um, and these are, these are flow lines that cross the level set sigma K times. Okay, so the flow line th like this is counted with you know, t to the zero. If it goes or it crosses this three times, it's counted with t cubed. And once you, once you do that, you get finite counts. Um, so then you get circle value more theory, and it's kind of fun in ways which are completely irrelevant to my talk. Okay, now, you could say, well, is this an in invariant? Um, if I do a homotopy of the function f, and if I change the metric g, replace it with some other metric, will I get the same homology? And the answer is yes. And you can prove this by following the usual strategy of defining continuation maps. Um, but for certain obscure purposes, which are beyond the scope of this course, sometimes you want to know in more detail what the, what the continuation chain map actually is. Or you want to define an explicit chain map. Um, so you want to know sort of what, so you want to sort of deform f and g in a homotopy, and maybe at some times during this homotopy it will fail to be generic, and you want to know as you cross that non-generic time, what, hap what exactly happens to the chain complex. Stay? Is it staying? I can't see. Yes, okay, good. So you have a... So I wrap this circle value of Moyes theory, why not just unwrap the circle? Mm -hmm. for that, so. uh, yeah, you can, you can do that. Although, although you still have to count with the Nova covering because then you'll have a, a non-compact manifold. But then if I know how usual Moyes functions change. Ah, but this is... Okay, you're about to see why it's, it's not that simple. Okay, so now I have a homotopy And let's say it's not generic at time t equals zero. Um, and there are various ways it can fail to be generic, but the one I'm interested in is where I have a critical point Q of index i, say, and I have a flow line from Q to itself. <coughs> call this gamma zero, or actually let's call it u zero. Okay, so u zero is a flow line from Q to itself. So this, the reason why I'm doing circle valued Morse theory is for this to be possible. You can't, this can't happen in real valued Morse theory. In circle valued Morse theory, this can happen. Um, let's, let's suppose that this intersects sigma just once. Um, I wanna know what's, what's gonna happen to the chain complex. And so you could have some other critical point P of index I plus one. So here's P. And there could be a flow line, let's call this U plus, from P to Q. Um, so this, um, so this, this thing has index equals one, this flow line. Um, and then sort of un unwrapping the circle, as Vivek suggested, to draw the picture, we could have a bunch of copies of this flow line U0 from Q to itself. So then we could say, well, here's this, here's this pretty non-generic thing. You know, it's a broken thing with many levels. And then if I perturb T a little bit away from zero, what's going to happen to this? So 
So you, you, it could happen that for T slightly negative or slightly positive, there's a, there's a flow line like this obtained by gluing all this together. Um, so the question is, so how many ways to glue this to a flow line for t not equal to zero? Um, and that's that's going to tell us how the chain complex changes. Like if there's Maybe there's, maybe there's no flow line here when T is negative, and there is a, suddenly a flow line appears when T is positive. So then the, then the differential of P is getting added to it, uh, T to the something times Q. Um, okay. So this is my... This is the simplest, simplest example of a problem I could think of for which we want to do obstruction bundle gluing. Um, and I sort of know what the answer is for obscure reasons. Um, so I'll tell you what the answer is, but then we're, we're going to try to actually understand what's going on. So um, there's a lemma. Which is that there exists a power series A equals 1 plus or minus T, and then I don't know what. Uh, um, such that um, so the differential after slight where, where T is slightly positive, so D plus denotes the differential for T is slightly positive. Um, and the differential for D slightly negative are obtained by conjugation by a map AQ. Um, where AQ of Q is this power series A times Q. Um, and AQ fixes all other critical points. Uh, and this A basically is a count of sort of flow lines that are created or destroyed in this bifurcation. Um, and then it's, it's a fact which follows by combining various obscure forgotten th theorems that, in fact, this power series is uh, 1 plus or minus t to the plus or minus 1 so with four possibilities. These signs are not related. Um, and I want to understand this directly by obstruction bundle gluing. So you're saying you take any generic path that goes through this, and then each such path will be one, one of those matrices with a path. Because I was just going to ask you, what's your model for going through? Because obviously, if you could go through from t minus to p plus, you could reverse t and go t in the other direction. And have to have the sort of Opposite power series, yeah. Yeah, so we're going to see that this, this depends on some very subtle data. But, but the nice thing about the obstruction bundle gluing is the analysis will, if we look at the analysis carefully, it will tell us exactly what's happening. It's very precise. It's, but we have to look at it carefully. Um, um, first of all, is it correct that T is used in two different ways? Oh, shit. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, right. Let's call this Q. No, I used Q already. <laughs> <sighs> Okay, well, we're, we're just going to have to learn to tolerate some ambiguity. Uh, we're, 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 we're never going let, to, but let's make this a capital T. How about that? Is that better? Yeah. All right. Any mouth? Okay. Sorry about that. Also, this lemma, uh, this is a fact I know from the usual Moist theory, since it only involves the first two terms. This, this lemma? Yeah, so this lemma, uh, it's proved by doing what you suggested and sort of unwrapping the circle and looking at what happens there. 
Okay, other questions about this? Yeah. Is there a straightforward criterion for which version of A is applied? <laughs> There's a non straightforward. Okay. So we're going to, there, there, there are like four or five different signs, and putting them all together, it's going to tell us what A is. Oh, and by the way, from now on, um, so to avoid my head completely exploding, I'm going to replace this with um, Z mod 2 coefficients. So normally you count, you have to count flow lines with signs, but um, I, I think it's sort of indecent to discuss that in public. Um, <laughs> so, so that this sign no longer matters. This sign still matters. So, so if using Z mod two coefficients, a is either one plus t, or one plus t plus t squared plus dot dot dot. Okay. So how do we glue this stuff? Well, so I'm going to let's let's do a warm up before we get to this. Um, let's see, where is the hook? Ah. I'm really impressed. No one said audience members. Not yet. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> how do I get that one? Oh, gosh. Um. <laughs> Here you go. I'm sort of afraid that I'm going to be like hanging on to the boards and then like lift it up. <laughs> um, OK. Right, so, so what's my warm-up problem? So the warm-up is let's, let's, let's look at the gluing needed to prove that d squared equals 0. So this is something which is supposed to be easy, but I'm going to make it difficult. Okay, um, so I'm going to review this in a slightly strange way because the, the instruction bundle gluing setup looks a little different from the way people usually do gluing. But so I'm going to do this in a strange way, which is then going to generalize conveniently to the non-transverse situations. Okay, so so we have a flow line P of index I minus index I plus one. Sorry. The flow line Q, so let's call this U plus, to Q, which is index I. And I have another flow line U minus to critical point R of index I minus 1. I want to glue these things to get an end of the moduli space of curves from P to R. Um, so these, let's write V for the um, gradient of f. And I, uh, I think I'm, v is the upward gradient. Um, and then these, these, a flow line u will satisfy the equation dsu plus v if u equals 0. So I'm thinking of, I really should draw the arrows going the other way. So, so they're parameterized like this. So flip, my flow lines actually go up. Okay. Um, so u is a map from r to x. Um, and I want to glue these things. Also, there's a, there's a, um, sorry. Say, Ugh. Yeah. Ugh. These signs are going to kill me. Okay. All right, and there's also a, there's a, a linearization of this equation, which I'll write as du. So this goes from, Sections of the, um, sorry, of a U star TX um, and we probably want to use some bottom space completion. It doesn't really matter which one as long as you have some decay conditions. So we could take L21 sections. Um,
Uh, so this is the derivative of this equation with respect to a deformation of u. Um, so du of some c is uh, the uh, covariant derivative of c in the direction of the flow line minus the covariant derivative of the vector field v in the direction c with respect to, say, the levy trivita connection. All right. OK. So that's, so now, so how am I going to glue these things? So I'm going to choose a very large value of r. Um, and I'm going to translate u plus up and u minus down, uh, the total translation distance will be r. Okay, so I pull, pull these things apart by distance r. Um, and then I'm going to have some cutoff functions. So I guess u plus up by, by r over 2, let's say, and u minus down by r over 2. Like, are you translating in the source R or the target X? What is that? Uh, well, it's sort of both, but, but uh, when U is a map, we'll define an R, so I'm going to compose that with a translation of R. Right, so, right, and I'm gonna cho I need to choose some cutoff functions. Uh, so there'll be a cutoff function beta minus, which will look like this. So here's r over 2, here's minus r over 2. <coughs> so it's 1 over here. And somewhere between 0 and r over 2, it, it, it dies. Um, and then there'll be a cutoff function beta plus, like this. I'll call this parameter s. Um, and the uh, size of the derivative of these cutoff functions is on the order of 1 over r. Okay. Um, and then what? So now, uh, this translation by r is it making them overlap more or less? So basically, you're you're pulling them apart. So. Um, so that sort of at time at s equals zero, they're sort of close to the critical. They're both close to the critical point Q. Okay. And then we uh, choose a coordinate chart on x uh, in a neighborhood of Q. Okay, and then we can we can pre-glue these things. Um, so. Um, so this is a curve which is, um, well, let me not put the S in there. So it, it's uh, beta minus times u minus plus beta plus times u plus. So for, for, S, for S less than minus r over 2, it's just u minus. For S Bigger than r over 2, it's just u plus. Um, and in between, we use these cutoff functions to interpolate between u minus and u plus. OK. Now, the usual approach would be you start with this thing, and then you perturb it, and you argue that you can perturb it to get an actual flow line. Wait a minute. You haven't shifted, though. Shouldn't you put the shift in my arm? 
The U plus were shifted. I guess I'm using the same notation. Well, so, you, so U minus is the, it's supposed to be shifted relative to each other. Isn't yeah, it? so these have already been shifted. So when I, when I said shift, when I said translate them up and down, I didn't use a notation for that. So these, have, these, these are the shifted, the translated U minus and U plus. Sorry about that. And the betas also have an R translation, right? <coughs> they, change, they change the R, the beta plus and minus also. No, I'm not doing anything to the betas. Betas stay the way they are. So, the betas do depend on R. Yes. Supposing I understood the tree blue ring from yesterday, is this like the same kind of thing, one dimension down? Yeah, it's the same kind of thing. Um, so I mean the picture, if you want a picture, then um, I had a picture and it's gone. Uh, so this is U plus and this is U minus then our flow line, so as S increases, so first we're following U minus, and we're, because U minus has been translated, we're following it for a very long time, so we're very close to Q. And then these cutoff functions kick in, and we start interpolating to U plus, and then we follow U plus like that. And I have some coordinate chart here, so all this cutoff function stuff is taking place inside this coordinate chart, so it makes sense. Yes. So as S increases, so we're following U minus until we're very close to Q. And then these, the, these cutoff functions kick in. And then we're interpolating to U plus. And then we're following U plus. It does not require that there's a relation between beta minus and beta plus, like beta minus equals 1 minus beta plus. I don't, I don't need that. Well, it could be, well, that you have two times. So what is, uh, you assume that the image of it could be form is 0? Um, right, yes. So, so this addition is defined with respect to my coordinate chart in which the critical point corresponds to zero. If I, if I wanted to say this a little more correctly, I would talk about exponential maps and so on, but I'm trying to make it as simple as possible. Okay, so that's the pre-glued curve and the usual, the usual way that this is presented is to say you would now try to, you would argue that this can be perturbed to an actual flow line. Then I'm going to do something a little different, which is I'm going to perturb the things before, before pre-gluing them and then pre-glue them. So it's going to look like this. So we're going to, so we're going to choose or let um, psi plus or minus be small sections, C0 small sections. of pullback tangent bundle. And we're going to look at a curve. Um, so let's consider um, beta minus times u minus plus psi minus um, plus beta plus times u plus plus psi plus. So this is, um, so this is my pre-glued curve, but it's modified using sections of the, well, well it's modified both on u minus and u plus. So, so on u minus, this is perturbed by psi minus. Um, and up here on u plus, this is perturbed by psi plus. Um, and in the middle, it's perturbed by some, some combination of psi minus and psi plus. OK. And those are the shifted ones. Yes. So u plus and u minus are always shifted. OK. And I want to say what I want to so solve for this to be a flow line. So we're going to solve. So, so when is this a flow line? So I'll just write the equation. And if you 
you've done this before, perturbing, the answer would have been never. Um, if, so, if the size are zero, then it's, you know, it won't be a full line. So I want to choose the size to make it a flow line. So I want to solve for that. I'm going to write down the equation for this to be a flow line and then solve it. Okay, so this is a little messy, but this is really um, the very simplest case I could think of. Um, and also, let's to make my life even easier, let's assume that let's assume that v is linear in this coordinate chart. I don't assume that there are some extra terms. In general, in this business, um, well, I mean, so I wrote these gluing papers with Tobbs, and so this is like my analysis training. So what I've learned is basically you sort of write down an equation, then there's the stuff you want, and then there's a whole bunch of crap, and you have to estimate all that crap to show that it doesn't matter. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Um, so I tried to make, but I'm trying to make this so there's as little crap as possible. Okay, so let's just write the equation. So I have ds minus v of this thing, beta minus times u minus plus psi minus plus beta plus times u plus plus psi plus. So what is this? Um, so there's a ds beta minus times u minus plus psi minus uh, plus beta minus times, uh, uh, I probably should be writing the uh, covariant derivatives here, but I'm just going to not worry about that. So ds u minus plus ds psi minus. Um, and there's a similar thing with, with plus. Um, and if you don't mind, I'm going to take the liberty of multiplying this term by beta plus and this term by beta minus, which I can do because the support of the derivative of beta minus is contained in the region where beta plus is equal to 1. So I can, I can, I'm allowed to do that. It doesn't change anything. And then I have to put in the vector field, so I have minus beta minus times um, v of u minus plus the derivative of v in the direction psi minus. Um, and then, in general, there's going to be some additional error term. I'll write this as q minus of psi minus. So this is, uh, basically, this is the Taylor expansion of the vector field. So it's the vector field plus its first derivative plus some quadratic term. Um, and then minus beta plus times v of u plus. I thought we agreed that the vector field is linear. Yeah, so near the origin, this, is all, this only comes up away, for, away from my, outside of my coordinate chart. So, so outside of your coordinate charts, you just take exponentials instead of sums? Um, so you put by sum doesn't only make sense in this coordinate chart? Yeah, yeah. So so this this is to be interpret this is to be interpreted as the exponential map of u minus evaluated on psi minus. So I'm I'm sorry for my sloppy notation. I just trying to trying to make it simple. Okay, and then we can cancel some stuff out because so u minus is a flow line, so ds u minus plus v of u minus equals 0. So I can cross this out. But likewise, u plus is a flow line. So I can cancel this ds u plus with this v of u plus. And what do I get? So I get um, uh, so I get beta minus times um, <clears throat> So, so another nice thing is this term, I really should make this a covariant derivative here. Let me do that. 
to be a little more honest. Um, so this nabla s of psi minus, minus nabla psi minus of v is the deformation operator applied to psi minus. So these two terms here are d minus of psi minus, where this is d minus is the deformation, the, lin the linearized equation for u minus. Um, and then what else is there? So then there's this uh, q psi minus, and then there's this uh, ds beta plus of times u plus plus psi plus. And then there's an analogous thing times beta plus. So I have beta plus times d plus psi plus plus q plus of psi plus plus d s beta minus. Uh, I guess these q's I have to subtract, it doesn't matter. Um, and then this times u minus plus psi minus. Okay, so this this thing is the failure of my thing to be a flow line. So I want to make this thing equal to zero. In the more general the more general situations, like in the papers with Tobbs, there there's a bunch of extra crap in here, which you then have to estimate. What time did I start? Uh, or how much time do I have left? You started at 10 after, so you have... Uh, okay. 22 minutes? Yeah. Okay, sweet. I can actually get somewhere then. All right. Um, so I'm going to rewrite this as beta minus times theta minus of psi minus psi plus plus uh, <clears throat> beta plus times theta plus of psi minus psi plus. So this is my equation for the thing to be the flow line. And then the, the first lemma you need is that if r is sufficiently large, then there exists a unique pair, psi minus psi plus, such that I guess these um, these are in, well, you have to assume some decay conditions like L21. So there's a, a unique pair, psi minus psi plus, such that psi plus or minus is perpendicular to the kernel of d plus or minus. So this is perpendicular in the L2 sense. Um, and I'm assuming that we're in a situation where d is defined, so these things are cut out transversely. So in this situation, um, d plus or minus is surjective. <coughs> and its, it's kernel is one dimensional g g given by the derivative of the R translation of the flow line. Okay. So there's this unique pair. Um, such that both theta minus and theta plus are equal to zero. And then now we've, if we have this lemma, then we've glued because if both of the thetas are zero, then certainly their sum is zero, and so it's a flow line. Um, and the idea of the proof, so I'm not going to go into too many analytic details um, because it will be too messy and take too long, or to be a little more honest, because I don't remember all this stuff from this paper, which was written eight years ago. You know, it's one of the, you know, the reason why the invention of writing was, 
so such a milestone in human culture is that you, you no longer have to keep things in your head. You can write them down and then forget them. <laughs> anyway, the idea of the proof is to, um, well, let me first rewrite the equation a little bit. So let, um, What? There were ravens that were fine when you... Uh-oh. Um, so what's my notation? Uh, right. So, uh, so let pi plus or minus, uh, is this really what I want? Sorry, hold on a sec. Uh, No, actually, I don't need this yet. OK, so sorry, never mind. Um, Which term is guaranteeing that after the curve, the end of one glues to the start of the other one? I mean, these are, these are decaying as you go to the ends. So these go to 0. So, so you don't, you don't, you're not going to escape this coordinate chart, and it's going to be OK. Yeah, well, yeah. I think the initial setup guarantees you that it's the 0 that I need to see. So there's a a um, um so there's an inverse so d plus or minus inverse which is going to go to the target use your favorite. favorite Bono space completion, um, which will give you an isomorphism to the um, orthogonal complement of the kernel of d plus or minus. Okay. Um, so I'm going to rewrite this equation. So the equation, so, so what is theta? Let's look at the equation theta minus equals 0. So this says that. Um, D minus psi minus is equal to Q of psi minus plus ds beta plus times u plus plus psi plus. Um, so then I can apply this inverse. So that's equivalent to saying that psi minus, remember I assume that psi minus is orthogonal to the kernel. Okay, so, so psi minus is equal to um, d minus inverse of q psi minus plus ds beta plus u plus plus psi plus. Um, and likewise, uh, theta plus is equal to 0 if and only if psi plus is equal to d plus inverse of q plus of psi plus plus ds beta minus u minus plus psi minus. So these are the these are the equations we need to solve. And then you want to use use the contraction mapping theorem in your favorite Bonner space completion. So you pick, pick your favorite bonus space completion, and then you want to show that the right side of this equation is a contraction mapping on the set of pairs psi minus and psi plus. If you look at this, well, this, this, this term with the u plus and u minus is a constant, so that's fine. Then I have the derivative of beta plus times psi plus. Um, and the derivative of beta plus is on the order of 1 over r. And I don't know what the operator norm of d minus inverse is, but if I choose r to be much larger than the operator norm of d minus inverse, then, then this part of the equation will be a contraction. And also, this quadratic term, if you set things up so that psi minus is <coughs> c0 small, then this, then this part will also be a contraction. Um, so you get a unique solution. Um, so ta-da, we've glued. Um, and then um, 
you can the facts to check. Uh, so this construction gives you um, a homeomorphism from the set of R sufficiently large to the set of gluings. So if, um, if you choose two different R's, you're going to get two different glued curves this way. And any, any curve which is sort of close in the sense of the usual compactness to this broken curve is actually obtained by this construction. Um, and it's a, it's a slightly weird construction because um, if you look at this thing here, so, so if you look at the psi minus, then when s is large, um, like up, up here in the picture, then the psi minus doesn't matter at all. So, the, so what we're doing to the curve up here doesn't depend on psi minus at all. And what we're doing to the curve down there doesn't depend on psi plus at all. But still, um, I'm solving for psi minus and psi plus, which are defined in the whole real line. So it's a little bit weird, because um, the psi minus and psi plus contain various additional information, which I don't care about. Um, so it's a little weird. But um, as we'll see, this is a useful way to do things, because it um, allows us to use the analysis of these operators, d plus and d minus. Yeah. Uh, so where, I can't currently see why it matters if it is linear or not. In this. Oh, I just I used it in this equation. Yeah. So I had this, um, I had V evaluated on this whole expression, and then I expanded that linearly, which I couldn't do if V were nonlinear. Ah, yes, you're right. Yeah. Uh, if, if it's not linear, then there's just some extra error terms, and it's not a big deal. Question? It seems like we solve a stronger question. So the equation we solve six out of nine and six of us and it goes to the zero. But originally we only the combination of the combination. That's right. Will we use some information? Uh well. Um I I don't know what to say. Anyway, there's a there's a unique psi minus and psi plus satisfying these conditions. If I didn't put all these conditions on, it wouldn't be unique, and then it would be more confusing. OK, so now let's do an example where this is an obstruction. But are you saying that it would be possible maybe to glue uh, using different Theta minus and theta plus to get that equation to be zero, even though individually they're not zero? I mean, you can change psi minus and psi plus. So in the region where, they, where both of the cutoff functions are non-zero, you could add something to psi minus and subtract something to psi plus, and you get the same curve. However, then you'd no longer satisfy the equations theta minus and theta plus equals zero. Okay, now here's warm up number two. And it's going to get a little more interesting. So, warm up number two, I have a one parameter family of functions, and at time t equals zero, but, um, there's a flow line, an index zero flow line. So, this goes from say q to r. So these both have index equal to i. And then maybe there's another flow critical point p of index i plus 1 and the flow line u plus. Okay. And then I want to I glue these to an actual flow line from p to r for t not equal to 0.
Now the thing is you actually, you can do this only for one sign of T. So either you can do it for T positive and not for T negative or vice versa. And the analysis is actually gonna tell us which. Okay, so how does this work? So, so what's, the, what's the construction? So again, we choose R very large. We translate as before. Um, and then what's the data or the inputs? So there's no assumption this when we have T, G, T, like uh, for T to zero, it's generic. Yeah, I do need generic. I do need generic. Um, so this, this, I'm going to assume that this... Um, okay, so, so the co-index co, co of this would be... The co-curl co, co, uh, would be one that would be filled up by V or something. Where did the fact yeah. that you weren't in a situation appear in the previous slide? Yeah, it's four walls had two four lines and you were doing that. What is the difference in this, this situation? Yeah, where did you use that? So what's different in this situation is that the... Um, the linearized operator for D0 is no longer surjective. So this has a one-dimensional co-kernel. And we, we can't glue these for fixing T. We have to change T to be able to glue. So the inputs for the gluing construction are a psi minus and psi plus as before, plus, uh, plus T. So I'm going to change to a different small time T and perturbed by psi minus and psi plus. Okay? And then from these inputs, we get... And what, what's the kind of larger goal of uh, all this discussion you're trying to... Is it to show that something about the, the homotopy invariance of this construction from the start? Or? Um, that is one thing you could do with this. Right now I'm just doing it as an example of the gluing construction. But yeah, if you want to, if you want to understand how Morse complexes change under bifurcations, and this is part of what you have to do. Okay, so then this, you get a flow line. If and only if again beta minus, of, of um, beta minus times theta minus of psi minus psi plus t plus beta plus times theta plus. Excuse me. There's no minus. There's a zero. Uh, okay, so you can you can do a similar calculation to this. There's going to be going to be an extra term because when you change t, you change the vector field. So so this state is zero of psi minus psi plus t is equal to d0, ah, uh, zero. So it's equal to d0 of psi zero plus, um, there's gonna be that uh, ds beta plus of u plus plus psi plus. And then an additional term, which we'll write as t, t times v prime where V prime is the derivative of the vector field with respect to T. Um, and then there, there may be some additional quadratic terms, which I'm, I'm going to ignore. And a similar expression for theta plus. So theta plus. Is D plus psi plus plus d s beta zero, u zero plus psi zero, plus t times the derivative of v plus some other stuff. So you said we use the, the index differences being one for surjectivity, but we don't actually need surjectivity. Right? We don't need the d plus minus two. So we could take orthogonal complement. Right, so we're going we're gonna to do something like that shortly. So here, the, this inverse operator I was defined in the whole target space. In general, it will just be defined on the image of the operator. No. Well, it will work up to an error, which I'm about to show you. Um, so here's the lemma. Um, 
let me let me state the limit, and then we can then we can discuss it. Um, so the lemma is that for t sufficiently small and r sufficiently large. There exists a unique pair, psi zero, psi plus, such that, so as before, psi zero is perpendicular to the kernel of d zero. Um, psi plus is perpendicular to the kernel of d plus. Um, theta plus of, um, psi zero, psi plus t is equal to zero. And as for theta zero, I can't necessarily get it to equal zero. What I, all I can get it, get, is that this is perpendicular to the image of d zero. Um, and the idea of the proof well, I shouldn't have erased this, but the idea of the proof is again use the contraction mapping theorem. Um, so when you do that, that the inverse operator is only going to be defined on the image. Um, so um, well, maybe I should write it down. So let's let's let pi zero be the projection to the image of d0. Um, so then, and then we have a d0 inverse goes from the image of d0 to the orthogonal complement of the kernel of d0. Um, and we're going to solve an equation that looks like um, well, what I want is that um, pi zero of theta zero is equal to zero. That's the equation I want to solve. Um, so I can write this as um, pi zero of uh, d zero psi zero equals blah, blah, blah. And then I can write this as, um, so, so now I can apply the operator d0 inverse to it. So I can write this as psi 0 equals d0 inverse of um, blah, blah, blah. I guess there's a pi 0 here also. So d0 inverse pi 0 of blah, blah, blah. And then you can do the contraction mapping theorems before. Um, but what's the punchline? Um, so I didn't quite, didn't quite get as far as I was expecting to get. Um, so I don't think I'm going to be able to completely explain this example today. But let me tell you what, what happens. So to glue, I really want theta plus and theta zero to both equal zero. And I can't get that. Well, I, I can get theta plus to equal zero, but theta zero it, it lives in a one-dimensional vector space. It lives in the um, complement, in the co-kernel of d0. It's a one-dimensional vector space. I can't get that to equal zero. So now we have this picture over here. Um, um, so I have m will be the set of all pairs T and R. <coughs> and over this, I have an obstruction bundle, O. Um, and so that, so this is a trivial bundle. The fiber over any point is the co-kernel of D0. And I have a section, S. And what is the section S? So S of t comma r is equal to this theta zero. 
Okay, so the gluing construction says, I can almost get the gluing to work, except the state of zero might not equal to zero. The state of zero is the obstruction to gluing. So when this is equal to zero, I can actually glue. Okay? So, um, so this is some function of t and r. When this function is zero, I get a gluing. Uh, and I run out of time. So in the next class, I'll tell you how to actually compute what this function is and how to s figure out whether you can glue for t negative or t positive. Um, and then I'll do the harder example, and then I'll do the holomorphic curve stuff. But I'll try to, I'll try to make stuff modular, like you know, the Titanic if, had this compartment, so if, if one part of it fills with water, they just seal it off so the ship won't sink. So I'm going to try to do that. So if you didn't understand anything, I'll sort of start over. As long as, if, if too many compartments fill with water, we'll still sink, but. <laughs> All right, so I'll, I'll be hanging around if anyone wants to talk about this stuff. Thanks. But are you and Chris having office hours tomorrow for this officially? I have no idea. Anyway, I will be hanging around after all of my talks to answer any questions. Call it office hours. Any questions? So in this example, the, or, so D naught doesn't depend on where you are in this space M. Yes. Right? So it's, it's, it's a very trivial obstruction. Yes. Other examples will be less trivial. But this one is, as I said, I tried to make the easiest one I could think of.